All right, I think now's a good time to get started. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Hannah Hollenberg. I'm the Policy Specialist at Hope Border Institute. Thank you so much for joining us this morning um, or this afternoon, depending on where you are, for a conversation on migrant resilience. I'll be moderating the discussion today, and I'm very proud to be able to present our amazing guests. Um, I had the honor of working with Mark Lusk and Georgina Sanchez Garcia to bring the publication, uh, The Paradox of Resilience, to life. They entrusted us with, with this work, um, so I was able to, to edit it with them and, and work towards bringing it to publication. Diego has shared the link to the piece in the chat, and I highly encourage everyone to read it. Uh, it's a very beautiful, very critical, timely reflection in migrants' own words about what they've been through and the tools that they've used to build strength and resilience throughout journeys that can often include a lot of uh, harm and a lot of suffering. So on behalf of Hope Border Institute, of Hope Border I wanna thank both Mark and Georgina for their decades of work with migrants and refugees and for trusting us with this important piece. So I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists and then we'll get started. Um, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. So first of all, Mark, Mark Lusk, the author of The Paradox of Resilience, is a professor emeritus of social work at UCAP. He's a former Fulbright scholar at the Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro and a member of the board of directors of Hope Border Institute. Georgina Sanchez Garcia is a Mexican psychologist uh, with a degree from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and she is currently a PhD candidate in health sciences at UTEP. She's also the co-author of this piece. Julia McPherson is the Director of Advocacy and Operations at Jesuit Refugee Services. She's currently the um, lead on, on the JRS policy and advocacy portfolio. And she um, serves as chair of the board of directors for Educate to Envision International and chair of the board of directors for AMP Global Youth. And then Maria Torres, also with JRS, is a Maya woman from Guatemala. She's accompanied and served migrant and refugee groups throughout the Paso del Norte region for more than 20 years. She's a community mental health educator uh, with a BA in clinical psychology from the Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala, an MA in applied cultural anthropology from Northern Arizona University, and a PhD in health sciences from UTEP. So thank you all so much for being with us here today. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mark to talk about the paradox of resilience and um, his work with migrants and refugees. Thanks, Hannah. Um, much has been written and said about the migrant um, in recent years, especially in the last five or six, and much of it has been negative, nativist, xenophobic, uh, and exclusionary in its tone. And what has been missing in all of this has been the voice of the migrant. And this is the part that we felt that we needed to address. Not to talk about what the people in Washington DC you think about and what the folks in Austin think about or what they think about in Mexico City or to define this entirely in academic terms, but to give voice to folks who are making that journey and to give them an opportunity to speak in their own words. How this started was uh, 13 years ago when I came to the University of Texas at El Paso to start a master's degree social work program. I took students over every Saturday morning to Ciudad Juarez and we visited a project called Casa Amiga, which was a project by Esther Cano. Esther Cano was a fabulous person who did this outreach to women who had experienced violence and also women who had experienced criminal victimization. And our students working there every Saturday heard these stories and I heard these stories. And I thought, oh, this is something that we need to write down and, and, and talk about and think about. And then as, as this was 2007 and Felipe Calderon, newly elected president had declared something of a war on uh, organized crime and the cartels. And as everyone knows, the situation in Mexico went downhill very quickly. And there was a large number of folks who came over the border to the United States seeking safety, seeking sanctuary. And the flow of individuals coming, usually families, women, children, 
were processed by the Annunciation House in El Paso as the central point of contact and through the parishes and congregations and nonprofits in El Paso, we were able to provide assistance to thousands and thousands of, of people who came to the border, not unlike the, the sanctuary movement of the 1980s. That was what we were doing here in El Paso. And in the course of that, I volunteered with the Annunciation House and with the Las Americas uh, Immigrant Advocacy Center and sat and had conversations with migrants from all through Central America and Mexico. And they began to tell me their stories, kind of like in the testimonial tradition of oral histories in Latin America. And I thought something that um, um, really resonated with me was that I was helping them give voice to the voiceless by writing down what they were saying and then talking about it um, in public settings. But also as a scholar, I felt like I needed to document this in a more formal way. And so with support from Programa de Investigación de Migración en Salud, which is a research program at the University of California, Berkeley, we received enough uh, funding for a decade that we were able to interview five waves of research, five waves of migrants through formal research where we asked them a set of standardized questions and then opened it up for wider discussion in qualitative uh, uh, manner, learning about their experience. And so after now, with a team of people that includes uh, Georgina Sanchez and other uh, graduate students and also other faculty at UTEP and other universities, we were able to interview um, many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of folks. And uh, we documented these, transcribed them, and we were trying to use in our mind as we listened to people, a couple of principles. One was the testimonial principle of hearing the oral tradition of the spoken word. And many of them were saying this, telling the story to me that, or to um, another member of the team for the very first time. They had just arrived in Ciudad Juarez or it just arrived in El Paso. And in many ways, it was an emotional experience as they began to process what had happened to them. Another element that has guided our work is the principle of conscientización, um, coming from the work of Pablo Freire, um, which was that it's not enough for us to write journal articles about this, but it was important to raise awareness and raise consciousness of people in this country about the experience, the lived experience of the migrant. And another thought that comes really from liberation theology, which guided our work, was the principle of accompaniment, that we weren't interviewing them, we were walking with them in their path and seeking to understand the lived experience that they had, not as subjects or participants in a research project, but as partners in an effort to bring forward the experience they have had, both positive and negative. And then final notion that we had is that we needed to document social suffering, not just the suffering of the person, um, the migrant her herself, but also the social suffering that was imposed on them by structures of oppression that they had experienced in Central America and Mexico and on the journey, and the same sorts of structures of oppression manifested differently, but very powerfully here at the border on the United States side. So those were some of the things that guided our work. As we listened to countless stories, there were some themes that consistently emerged. One was suffering. They suffered greatly, but they assigned meaning to their suffering. It wasn't as if they were just victims, in fact, Almost never did I hear them frame their experience as victims. So the suffering that they felt was a suffering of things that had been imposed upon them, which they were trying to overcome and which they were able to overcome because they had connections and social connections to other migrants and to other people, because they had strong cultural traditions that sustained them, and also because they had faith. And this faith, whether it was expressed through a formal religious tradition or through a more individualized spirituality tradition, that itself gave them the real power and the capability to overcome and transcend the experience of, 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 of being forced to suffer on this perilous trail of tears. 
They also spoke incessantly of their hope, and it wasn't just a hope for themselves. Primarily, it was hope for their family. So the theme of family was consistently there. How did, why, why am I doing this? I'm doing this for my child because I don't want him or her to experience what my childhood was like in Honduras. I can't go back because I will be murdered. My husband will be murdered. So I have this hope that I'm going to be able to benefit and better my life by making this migration. Um, and finally, the most important element, I think, that protected people and resilience is the capacity to overcome was their social connections to other travelers and to people along the way. These were folks who were not traveling in isolation for the most part. Some children and some individuals have made an individual trek or journey, but mostly came in migrant trust networks of groups of people who were connected through cell phones. They were talking to relatives in the United States or to family back home in Honduras or in other parts of the Northern Triangle of Central America. But these sorts of connections were sustaining to them. So what we came away with now in reflecting about this when Georgina and I talked about all of these interviews and all of these transcriptions was that we're not dealing with broken people who need to be fixed. We're dealing with people who transcend that experience and are resilient and strong. And it's paradoxical because what they experience is, is so aversive. But at the same time, it pointed to an issue that our institutions are not resilient. Why do we force the migrant to take on all of the burden of, of superando esta experiencia tan difícil que han experimentado, why do we ask them to draw on their own individual and cultural resources? How can we as a society, how as we as communities of conscience, people of conscience, mobilize our resources to make this a much more humane process? So that was what inspired us to write this report and um, to, to document this so that um, they were able, would be able to say these things in their own words. And the document that you have on the link here in the chat is, is, is extensively just the words of people who have made this journey. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, really appreciate those words. I'm gonna turn it over now to Georgina so that she can share a little bit about her work with, with children in Mexico. Hello, everybody. My name is Georgina Sanchez, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Uh, my academic and professional experience has been with children victims of hardship. And I have seen and learned about the temporality and subjectivity of trauma and how it might evolve. That, that, that is why when, when I came to, to El Paso six years ago and, and I saw the children of Tornillo, I, I knew where, how, how, I knew where they were gonna, my end up. Uh, and, and then I, I pursued, uh, then I, I, I met Dr. Lask after, after completing my, my uh, master's degree in, in mental health counseling. And, um, so, so since the last uh, two years under the supervision of Dr. Lask, we have been studying the complex case of, of migrant children uh, from, northern, from the jungle northern, uh, northern jungle in Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, Honduras, and Mexico. Uh, and just, just to let you know some figures, in 2019, Mexican authorities identified more than 52,000 children in a situation of migration, mostly from this region. And in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, the number of children who transit through Mexico to the United States uh, increased nine times during the first uh, three months of 2021. That means that, for instance, in March 2020, there, there were, they, they identified 380 migrant children uh, trying to uh, accompany it or not, and no accompany. And from January to March 2021, there were 3,500 children. 
and and they are not uh, living because of the the uh, the, the the recent uh, political changes or presidential change in in the United States. They are they are fleeing their region because uh, they they just cannot uh, deal with with the last. Uh, the, the last situation of, of the pandemic. And as Dr. Last mentioned it, during the journey through Mexico, the, and then located on the border with the United States, migrants are exposed to different forms of violence. Migrant children are often exposed to both observation and direct experience of violence and victimization. Children can be separated from their families, either by authorities or, or, by, uh, or, or by criminals, and they can be trafficked and ultimately killed. Uh, violence is most often described in physical terms. However, its impact can extend to their emotional and moral integrity. It is important to note that the construction of the child's reality is different from that of the adult and is subject to their stage of development. That is quite important to, to consider the, uh, the age of the, of the child in, in order to, to approach them. Uh, the younger the child, the greater the possibility of emotional damage from the impact of a, stressor, a stressful situation. However, a child has, a, an, an, has neuroplasticity, which gives a, key, a, key, a great advance uh, from, from, from the adults. So, so there, there is a, a great hope for us to, to intervene time to intervene. Uh, equally important is the support of their social networks and cultural values that reduce the adverse effects of a stressor and promote their well-being, relationships, uh, self-efficacy, and identity. Uh, but as Dr. Last mentioned, we, we, we wanted to to take this task to to give each child voice and and believe me what they what they said some some of it you can you can read it in the report and those that report was oh, uh, uh, those testimonies were collected basically from the southern border from from between Guatemala and Mexico and and their their experiences it can be in a way similar to, to their parents or to the adults, but in a much, much vivid and colorful way. And, and we, were, we are interviewing children from ages eight to 12, which is the operational stage of development. Although each age is considered uh, in in by by its own right, uh, but what, what I'm trying to say is that children, when 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 they trust you, they they don't go through the bushes. They they tell you exactly what is going on, and and they are reporting. Uh, they are reporting a, a, a information that that possibly. Some adults are not reporting. For instance, they, when, when adults when adults talk, they talk about the family, right? But but children report exactly what part of the family, which are basically their their grandparents and their their pets. They I mean, for a child to leave their their pets or or to leave their their brothers and little brothers and sisters is uh, they, they 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 live with us during the whole journey, um, and but make not mistake, the ones who are leaving their country are the strongest emotionally and physically, and but not not only this uh, and also spiritually, 
because they are living because they are just not agreed with with the corruption in this in this world with the violence in in what is one in what uh they are doing to to the nature and and that's the basic report that 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 they are destroying their their home and they and they are destroying the home or they are taking away from them their their lands especially the indigenous children and and that is why it's super important to understand this phenomenon from from a cultural point of view other otherwise is is um it, it, it might be incomplete and for instance indigenous people they 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 do they are not willing to sell the land their lands to to the criminal uh groups or to the um to to, to the to other other companies uh, the the mine the miners and and all of that because because they they know that they need to take care of their of mother nature and and also children from El Salvador or from Honduras they know that that what the gangs are doing is is just not correct the oppression and what is going on in the country is it is not correct and and their, their values are are higher than that, and that is why they are living. They, they are, and, and, and when when I been interviewing them, I was just thinking, they, their country don't know what they, what they are neglecting, and also the countries who, I, I mean, the United States and, and other countries, they just don't know what they are projecting. And I give the floor to to my to to Julia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgina. Um, that's a really powerful testimony. Thank you. I think we're actually going to pass it over to Maria Torres and then Julia. I was introduced saying that I I have worked you know, with migrants in El Paso for twenty years, but my experience working with migrants goes back to the 1990s when I was studying anthropology. Um, at the time, um, I was um, trying to understand, I am a trained psychology as well in Guatemala, and I was trying to understand and treat mental health problems, uh, taking into consideration the social and cultural um, aspects that inform health. So that's why I decided to study anthropology. But as part of my uh, anthropology studies, I went and did some ethnographic work with Mayan immigrants from Guatemala in the United States. Again, it was back in the 1990s. Um, when I started that program, I, I was still very much into mental health. And I thought that I was going to find a lot of troubled people. Uh, because if probably some of you might be familiar with the experience of the Maya, uh, these people went through genocide in Guatemala. And the group that I worked with was a group of refugees, not officially recognized because many of them weren't believed about their experience, but um, they were refugees. They fled Guatemala because they were targeted by the um, genocide that was taking place there. So these individuals were people who had themselves been physically attacked, um, that had lived through massacres, that had uh, family members probably kidnapped, and um, who had their their lands taken away, um, displaced internally. So again, my my idea was when I started that study that I was going to find a lot of trouble people. But my surprise, and this is this goes to the title of this presentation, the paradox that I found that I that opened my eyes to the importance of of not focusing only on the bad, but in the many strengths that they have. So when I was completed that that study, I was able to identify um, 
that the majority of people were um, emotionally, emotionally healthy, that despite all that they have gone through, in addition to the exclusion to the, um, in addition to the racism, in addition to the exploitation, and the poverty in which they have been maintained for centuries now, they were healthy, they, was, they were strong, and they were really willing to continue with their life in the United States. These individuals were so strong, and to me, they were so wise that they wanted me to do that research so I could write, they call it um, a book. They say, escribe ese libro. And they wanted that book or those stories registered for the future generations because they wanted to prevent them from coming to the United States. And the reason for that is that we didn't find, or I didn't find any, well, I didn't find these troubled people, as I said before, uh, given what they had gone through, but I found out that was that what was affecting them more was the new reality in the United States. And this was because they kind of came to the end of the rope because they didn't have support in the United States because even if they are very hard workers, they are not allowed to work because they don't have documents because um, people wouldn't believe when they share their stories. So they wanted their youth uh, to, to avoid that. They wanted for the youth to remain in the country and stay there and be productive members of their society. But like um, Georgina was sharing, things are such that the youth are still living, unfortunately, for Central America. And that's something that to me is very, I was saying at the beginning of, of the meeting, upsetting seeing this reality that uh, and I and I talk about the migrants uh, like my people because I'm from Guatemala and I have lived in Central America, so I very much identify with them. It's like the best of my people are leaving our countries, unfortunately, for Central America. So that was the beginning of of my work with migrants, and after that, I've been in El Paso working with other migrants. I have been a visitor to the detention center. I have worked with people from different places. Um, for my doctoral studies, I was to, I did um, study on resilience of Mexican immigrant women, which um, found many of those factors that uh, Mark mentioned already. The spirituality, part is probably what impressed me the most in the sense that they that's a very fa a strong factor for them to continue being resilient. And also the fact that people, because of what they have suffered, I cannot say this is not good. The suffering they have gone through is so much. But they, as I said before, they are wise and they know, they have learned from the experience. They know that all that adversity and problems are not permanent. So they know that they, it will get better with time and if they work hard. So they live with that hope that pushes them to go beyond all these injustices, injustices that they confront. And I think that's something that needs to be known. Because like Mark was saying as well, we think of them as victims, pobrecitos personas. Yes, they have suffered. They have suffered a lot, more than enough. But still, they persevere, they continue, and they are willing to, to be productive members of society if they are allowed to. So that's my experience. That's what I've been doing all these many years. And so I'll leave the floor to Julia, I guess. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thanks, Maria. Um, so Julia McPherson, I'm with Jesuit Refugee Service based here in Washington, D.C. And Maria is one of our amazing colleagues um, leading our work currently at the border in El Paso. We're so, so thankful to her. What I'm just going to spend a few minutes discussing is presenting a bit about the global context within which we're talking about resilience. And 
In Mark and Georgina's report, they actually discuss a bit in the early portion that there is this global context that we have to consider. Um, that unfortunately, when we're talking about global displacement, it's not just an issue happening in our own hemisphere, but we are seeing increasing numbers of forcibly displaced persons all around the world. So we at JRS are operating in about 50 plus countries. We serve about a million refugees every year. Um, but that's only a drop in the bucket. There are actually 82.4 million refugees and other displaced persons around the world. And these are figures that the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, tracks every year. And they just came out a couple years, a couple months ago. Um, so that 82 million number, unfortunately, has been increasing year to year. And UNHCR is predicting that, you know, we can feasibly reach 100 million refugees and displaced persons very shortly. Um, within that 82 million number, we have refugees who have been given the refugee designation, about 26 million. The majority of that number, though, um, about 40 million plus, are internally displaced persons. And then we also have asylum seekers and a few others. Um, what's not captured in that number are individuals who've been displaced by natural disasters, by the effects of climate change. Unfortunately, UNHCR isn't tracking that, and there really isn't a, a global mechanism to track those numbers. But we do know, and we see it again in our own hemisphere, that people are fleeing for a multitude of reasons, not just persecution and conflict, human rights violations, but certainly the inability to sustain their lives and their livelihoods within their own countries. So there's a number of reasons why individuals and families are fleeing. Um, and again, we're seeing those numbers continually rise. Unfortunately, those problems aren't um, decreasing. The causes of migration and displacement aren't, increase, aren't, aren't decreasing. When we talk about conflict in particular, you know, we're seeing that there are still new and even re-emerging emergencies. Just a couple of examples are what we're seeing in Ethiopia right now. For example, a new civil war that erupted late last year. Myanmar, where a coup um, took over earlier this year, and we're seeing large numbers of displaced persons, both internally and externally. And even today, if you're, if you're looking at the news, what we're seeing happening in Afghanistan is really um, a tremendous concern. We have an office there. We actually have operations in all three of those countries, but people are really fearful for their lives. And we're seeing Afghanistan becoming, an, again, a re-emerging um, emergency. And then we have what we call more protracted crises, uh, crises that are sort of never ending and individuals who have been displaced due to those crises um, and aren't unable to have a durable solution. They're unable to go home. They're unable to um, be resettled to a third country and they are living in this kind of limbo for many, many years. And so for all those reasons, again, we're seeing these numbers increase year on. In terms of what we're seeing, though, as JRS and, um, and the resilience that we're seeing in the individuals that we encounter every day, you know, our programs focus on a few key areas. One is mental health and psychosocial support. Another is reconciliation among communities, both among and between displaced communities and between displaced communities and their hosts. Um, and education is a key part of our work as well. And so what we're seeing and what we witness every day is that accompaniment that, that Mark spoke about earlier. It's a key part of what we do in walking with refugees. We, we see that they are looking at ways to educate their children, to earn a livelihood for themselves, um, that they are their biggest champion. And what we try to do as an organization is really amplify um, their, their wants and their needs and their hopes and their dreams um, through our work. So not only through our programmatic work, but the, the fourth sort of pillar of our, of our work around the world is really advocacy. And I know we'll talk a bit more about that in a bit, but um, by really, again, amplifying the voices of those that we serve, um, we're able to advocate on their behalf and, um, and lift up their voices to advocate on behalf of themselves as well. So I'll, I'll end there. I know that we have more time for, for Q&A um, and happy to answer questions at the end as well. Thank you so much, Julia. We have a couple of discussion questions that we're going to um, go over and then towards the end, we'll have, again, an opportunity for audience questions. So my, my question to all of the panelists is, what are some of the most powerful coping strategies and tools that you've seen migrants and refugees and asylum seekers develop 
And have you seen change over time in how those resilience models have have changed? Have has there been a a change in in what you've observed and how people build resilience? Yeah, I could start on that, uh, Hannah. Um, one of the things that everyone who spoke reaffirmed was the importance of faith in this journey, and it wasn't faith that was discovered because, oh, now I find myself in a horrible situation, so I'm going to pray. This was a faith that was with them from the very beginning that was actually um, potentiated and strengthened by the process of migration where they were connecting on a regular basis with God or their their higher power to, to guide them and protect them. In many ways, they, they didn't use this word, but they saw it as a pilgrimage. Um, that they were making a pilgrimage to a different future. And the religious metaphors that I see in, in this experience are, are so profound because that sense of connectivity to other people uh, was expressed when they got together silently in, in meditation or prayer uh, to process what was happening to them and to feel that they were part of a community. Um, that was one of the most powerful coping mechanisms. And we see in the social science and psychology literature that religiosity is a strong protective factor um, in, in, in well-being. And, and this paradox of how people could report that their well-being was so, so strong, um, were so high when the cir circumstances they faced were, were so dire. Um, other, other things that people used were connections to, as, as Georgina mentioned, connections to culture. So they, they continued to be Hondureñas and Salvadoreños and, and to identify as part of the cultural tradition and the values that are inherent in those cultural traditions like familismo and compadrasco and comunidad, uh, all of those communitarian and collectivist values that you see in Mesoamerica and, and Mexico were very much activated by this process of experience, uh, of migration experience. So those coping, ex coping mechanisms um, were, were powerful. What was different, I think, as time has gone by, is that some of the reasons that reasons people are leaving are changing. Um, we're seeing more people who were, who were saying that they were starving to death, um, that they'd been displaced from their land, uh, that they, and children, that Georgina and I spoke with would say, my brother died of hunger. Um, that, and, the, and they were, when you physically looked at them in the shelters, they were malnourished. So the landlessness, the dislocation from their traditional lands and their indigenous lands, and the effects of these recent um, climate changes, the hurricane that just went through Central America earlier this year, all of those were factors. But um, yeah, it's a complicated, Thank you. Anyone else want to chime in on that question? Yes. Yeah, add something. Oh, go ahead, Maria. No, I was going to say only that I I agree with my Mark. It's one of the things that I see more strongly, and as I said before, it's so I I I don't even have like an adjective a qualifier for the the type of spirituality life that these individuals have. Because and it's not only faith in the sense of religion and God, but it's, it's I mean it's, it's it's complex, but it's it's really one of the main things. And when I did my last uh, research with women, um, what surprised me and I is something that I hadn't considered is the fact that, as I say, they are they are not afraid anymore. And it's like when you see the, that type of situation in, in your in your life when you experience like Mark was saying, you know that your brother or little sister died of hunger and then you see what's happening with the land and he's so um despairing but at the same time they know that's not permanent. It's not. And so they continue with the hope that they will be better. It might take time, but it will be better. So those two things is what I think uh, to me were um, very impactful when I was doing research. And I, I I continue seeing those among the different groups that I have been working with. Go ahead, Julie. And I just wanted to quickly add um, was that, you know, we, what we've seen in some of our work around the world as well has been this just a strong desire for a new life, a better life. Um, 
Um, in particular, the, the education work that I mentioned earlier, that's been an area where we've seen um, that that has really been a core part of the, the resilience that's been demonstrated in the populations that we've served. And some research that we're seeing come out now about the pandemic is that in some refugee communities, um, the refugee students or the internally displaced students have been per performing better or have had um, been able to commit to their, their educational opportunities, their studies more so than the host communities. They have a better appreciation for the opportunity that's been afforded them and, um, and have really been able to, to demonstrate this commitment to achieving an education. So I think it's, it's fascinating to see some of that data starting to come out. Um, and how they compare to, again, their host communities. So I think that really looking ahead, hoping for the future, building on um, their capacity to have a future for themselves and their families really is a, is a source of um, resilience and a coping mechanism for many of them. Um, in, in, my, in the case of migrant children, the, the ones I interviewed, we interviewed in the Southern border, as everybody said, they, they not only believed in God, but they, they felt seen by God. They, they felt, and um, same, same to the Mexican children of the Southern, from Chiapas, for instance, or Oaxaca. It, they, they had this uh, strong belief uh, from from that that of, of this divine figure, and of course is nurtured by their parents. But most, but after after that time, they they were not nurtured not only by their parents but but by their community. And what I'm I am pointing this out because when I. When we interviewed the children, the children in Ciudad Juarez in the Northern Triangle, uh, the ones that have been traveling from from the southern border, uh, I mean from from the from the Northern Triangle. Uh, remember, I told you that this this stage of development is the is the operational. They they they, they were not talking any more about God there um, and, and I prompt them about like and what else makes you go in, go go ahead and and they were saying my mother or I mean the concrete you know my mother my my father whoever was with them and but but they they didn't mention God they, because and, and then I asked, uh, and I asked them. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't help myself. And I asked them, "What about God?" And, they, and they, they were just looking to other side. They, they, they. But on all the children, the ones who were coming from Central Mexico, from Michoacan, for instance. They were like like when I encountered the other ones in southern border in the southern border. They they were all they, they were talking about God in the same with the same hope and and, uh, and I asked them what how do you think is God and they were saying God yo, yo creo que Dios es bien buena gente. They 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 picture God as, as a person. They they don't they, they they don't see it as a complex fi figure. So that that is why um, these, these children when when they cross Mexico they cross uh, by we are talking of those children that cross by land and, and and through and through big bands furgonetas they call it furgonetas and one of the the, the the, the, one of the children, they were, he was counting how many were the, were them, and they were over three hundred people in one in one truck, and they were they they seen babies dying right next to them. So, so yes, I just I just wanted to point that out that because yes, they they kept traveling with their parents. But really, the source of 
of their faith is from from the community and and here we are we have we have some work to do Hannah, what's happening is they're experiencing serial trauma they've experienced it in the country of origin they've experienced it on the journey they've experienced it again at arrival at the border and in their interface with the u.s customs uh, and immigration system experience it again so they're traumatized serially and the and the result of that is complex trauma and and i i i look at it as a social worker as institutionalized cruelty we've set up a system in in the united states that it does exactly the opposite of what we need to be doing our system is not capturing the strength and resilience of, of people it's dehumanizing even the, them even further separating children from families um, prolonged detention, rapid uh, deportation, sending them to cities that they are not their home cities, taking them to the bridge and deporting them, stealing their documents from them, serving them horrible food, keeping them in cool freezer uh, temperature rooms. This whole process is intentional. It's cruel and it needs to be dismantled. Absolutely. Um, and that's actually the the last kind of discussion question. Um, we're seeing, as as Julia mentioned, increased levels of migration, and we know that climate change is is harming people's livelihoods and people's ability to survive in their own country. And so we can anticipate that there will be more out migration from from countries in, for example, Central America, and and we're also seeing people from, um, you know, from Asia, from parts of, of South America who've really struggled through the pandemic. And as Mark mentioned, we do have this, this apparatus that forces people to endure trauma and then forces them to then build resilience um, through the, the system of, for example, externalizing the border, that you know, using security forces in Mexico and, and Central America to deter people. And then that results in violations of human rights and, and violence against migrants. Everything from, from that system to then the detention, sort of deportation mechanism, all of that puts people in a really, really difficult and traumatic um, spot and forces them to, you know, abandon their, their migration claim or, or continue despite really difficult odds. And so, so the system is not set up to serve people. It's not set up to help people and, and help them build a life for themselves. And they do it anyway. You know, they build resilience, they build strength. So the question is, how can our systems, how can we as a community, as advocates, as members of, of the faith community, as just members of the public, how can we honor this resilience and work to build systems and infrastructure that facilitate people's migration and that don't force them into such traumatic and difficult circumstances. In the case of migrant children, for instance, Mexico signed the uh, to, again uh, to the Convention of the Human Rights, the superior right of the child. The United States is the only country who hasn't signed, and and although Mexico, uh, also El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, all all of these countries signed and recognized their, the, the right of the child and that has to be protected regardless of the territory, they are just not doing it. And, and, and that is why it's important to, to listen to the children because they, they, they are denouncing what is happening. And, and that, that that is that is one 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 way to to promote the the the, the establishment of the superior right of the child in, in this case. I'll jump in. You know, communities are doing amazing work, um, and organizations are doing amazing work on the ground. Um, but we also certainly want to flag the important role that advocacy plays in really trying to address some of those barriers, those policy barriers, and and we know that. In particular, the U.S. government, you know, has been 
um, implementing a series of, of, um, of efforts to really dismantle our current asylum system. Um, we posted in the chat earlier a link to a joint action alert that, that we at JRS and, and Hope Order um, launched a couple of weeks ago. And it's really looking at the, the most serious um, um, uh, act right now that's, that's sort of um, taking place is this Title 42 policy, which was instituted about a year ago at the beginning of the, the pandemic and has for all intents and purposes really closed the border to asylum seekers, except in some, um, in some circumstances where exceptions are being made. So this policy, unfortunately, the Biden administration has really doubled down on it. And we're seeing even now um, individuals being turned away at the border and not only pushed back to Mexico, but pushed back um, even further into, into southern Mexico um, and or and were deported to their, their home country. And so this is just one example, the latest example of where we need to really speak out and take action and, um, and become advocates on behalf of and, and alongside uh, those that we serve. So I think just the important role that advocacy plays in, in this specific circumstance and in all of the work that we at least at JRS are doing around the world is, um, is really, really critical. Thank you. And please do sign on to that action alert. Um, that's, that's one, one way you all can, can support this work and this advocacy is to sign on. One thing I'd also just like to point out, um, you know, in our view, addressing the root causes of migration um, you know, as, as Hope Order Institute, we, we do have a root causes initiative. And so we see that as being a really important part of, of addressing this, um, this policy disconnect. We know what the root causes are, poverty and violence, an economy that's stacked against people. And then of course, climate change will add a new dimension to that. Um, but then there's also, you know, the, the need to respect the right to migrate and, and to end practices like Title 42 that really aim to deter people and make it as difficult as possible for them to reach any kind of conclusion or to reach their, their destination. And so ending practices like that, everything from wall building to regulations that make it really hard for people to assert their fear and go through their asylum case, um, security agreements with other countries where they forcibly push people further south. So it, that's that's our view, respecting the right to migrate as well as addressing the root causes. So we wanna you know, open it up. We have a few minutes left. Uh, does anyone have a question or, or want to sort of have a, an open discussion? I know a, a couple of people have shared their experiences in the chat and um, Patrick Timmons shared a question that I think we addressed, but Anyone wants to, you know, this is a, a meeting format, so you can unmute, you can ask a question live to, to these amazing panelists. And Gabriel Ibarra. Yes, I, I have a quick question, and this is for, for all the, all the panelists. Uh, very excellent presentation. I, I've learned so much, you know, with the conversations from Mark and Georgina. I haven't had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, Julia or, or uh, everyone else, but my question is: if if you if you guys just stated that those that are migrating are the best, right? So what is going to happen to the population that is left behind? That's my now my concern. I mean, everyone is just saying, "Oh, so let's go and support the development of those regions." But if the best are leaving, then what's going to happen to those regions? Thank you. Well, Dr. Ibarra Mejia, that's a great question. And, and I think um, that Hannah has uh, touched on the issue by talking about root causes. We, we can't just deal with the stuff that we have to deal with in the receiving countries. It's terribly important that we create humane and just immigration systems and engage in comprehensive irrigation, immigration reform. But at the same time, as Hope Border Institute uh, root causes, causes initiative is is undertaking how does how do countries of the global north assist countries of the global south in regularizing normalizing and 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 pacifying their situation such that there's no incentive to leave in the first place because uniformly in conversations that i've had with migrants they said i did not want to leave 
I wanted to stay with my family. I wanted to stay with my abuelita. I wanted to stay with my community. And I, and one among all of the many things that I've lost, I've lost my country. And so we put people in a situation and the, that they are forced migrants. This is the other thing. You know, a lot of people portray the migrant as who, tr through the traditional lens of migration, economic migration. And there's been economic migration back and forth from Central America, Latin America, the United States, bi-directional, continual for as long as this country has been around. Um, and so that continues. This is different. This is forced migration. And it's a global issue, as Julia has said. This is going on in Central America. Asia, it's going on in Africa, it's going on in the Middle East. And countries in, in, in the global north, whether they're in Europe or in the United States or elsewhere, are being right now affected by a uh, nationalism and, and uh, that, that's informed by racial animosity um, that, that is of great concern because they're framing the immigration debate in uglier and uglier terms all the time. For instance, one of the things that we just heard is a governor in this state uh, said that COVID rates in the in our state are growing as a consequence of migrants. This is one of the oldest and ugliest tropes that have ever been used against migration. These sorts of themes, these sorts of narratives need to be replaced by the kinds of themes that we're talking about here, that th this is the best and the brightest, but at the same time, they don't want to actually be here. There's another question in the chat uh, from Joanna. What are your suggestions or recommendations for those who want to support and help migrants in their local communities? Uh, in, I, I, I would tell them that to get in touch with the shelters that, that right now are helping them and they, they, need, they need help. They have to give them food every every single day. They need medications. And the most depressing part is that that they they need connection. Those shelters need connection to, to, to the hospitals and medical medical assistance because 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 being migrants they they are not accepted, at least in Mexico. I'm talking about Mexico. So they, they are rejected only because they're supposed not to do it. But they made them wait the longest, and, and the child is, con is with convulsions, and, 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 and they are not accepted in the emergency room. So, so in the meantime, while while we do something about policy, and, and while we all talk about human rights, the the, the fastest way to to help this humanitarian crisis is to get in touch with those shelters that, that are helping migrants. And mostly in the southern border because all eyes in the are, and of course, by all means, the northern border needs help, but southern border, nobody really cares about them. The, 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 the lady who is taking care of one of the shelters, I mean, she she does whatever she needs to do in order to 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 bring them rice and, and beans. So that, that would be my suggestion. Yeah, um, I think that one something that everyone can can do anywhere is is get informed and be involved. Um, there are Jerez is is creating an accompaniment network, um, for, uh, trying to find individuals who are willing to uh, support asylum seekers in any location in the United States. Uh, and in the process, we have found, found out many individuals and small groups that are working to help locally. So I think it's a matter of, of looking within your community who, it is, who is there, who is already helping, because there are many individuals and groups that are already helping. Or you can also contact us. Um, 
but I think that that's the important part. Right now we're talking about the border. I mean, the people who are talking are presenting or with the exception of Julia, Julia is in, in DC, but we're here at the border. But um, the situation that the, the need is all over in Mexico, in Central America, but in the United States as well. And just focusing in the border on the border is not enough because people are traveling into the United States. Of course, they have permission to enter. And so with that permission, I think that they are they are open to to find jobs probably or have need, medical needs or have emotional needs. And so all that 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 help is is something that any any person anywhere can contribute to because they are going to different places all over the country. So I would say that's that's a way to to help. Great. And I see a question about how do we ensure that this issue is elevated on the growing list of priorities facing the administration and be sure that the media keeps this in front of people so it is not lost. Um, I would say, you know, you all have an important voice. This is a this is an opportunity for everyone here to write an op-ed, get in touch with your representatives, talk to everyone you know about it. Um, I think just the power of, of each person using their voice and, and reaching out to those, finding the border in your own community and reaching out to those who are marginalized in the community and supporting in that way is, is incredibly important. So that would be my um, suggestion. So- Yeah, the- just fly, Hannah. Sorry, if, if anyone who takes the action today, the joint action we- included that those are communications that will go actually directly to President Biden, the Vice President, Vice President Harris, um, your senators and your representatives. So they will receive a communication acknowledging that you are um, concerned about Title 42 in particular and access to asylum at the border. So that's absolutely step one that you can take today. Perfect. Um, Well, thank you so much. I wanna thank all of our panelists. This has been an amazing discussion and I've personally learned a lot. So thank you all so much for your work and and thank you, Mark and Georgina, for entrusting us with this wonderful publication. It's live on our website and the the link is available. So really suggest that everyone go and take a look at that. And also, you know, check out um, the work of JRS, the work of Hope Border. So really, really grateful. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah, and to the Hope Border Institute for your support of this important project. Appreciate it, everybody, and have a great day. All right. Everyone. Everyone.